I'm doing pics for Twitter. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Oh. Okay. Yeah. We're being cute. Okay. Okay. I, well, no, Chuck's arm is in the way. I'm trying. I was like, I'm trying not to hit my butt in the way. Wait. <laughs> they call you Chuck? Chuck or Charlie Bliss, yeah. <laughs> can I move now? He's too okay. Yes, those are fine. Okay, you can send them to me too. Yeah. All right. So, it is Sunday. It is service day. We are doing metanoia, which is what we call our Sunday school. Which the word metanoia, yeah. Okay, surprise. Um, I need to add that to the slideshow. Metanoia means change. Change. So it's actually the same word as repent. Mm. So, and I, look, I did good today. I, like I said, I have on shoes. And I'm doing, I'm going to get out of the way so that we can actually see. Okay, I got to work. What I'm doing is Christianity worse than other religious groups? Yay. Okay, so this started because people on the internet are annoying me. As and what? As they do. As they do. So I thought about how to explain this and the premise for this. And my basic argument is that us saying that Christianity is the worst thing in the world is still Westerners making themselves the center of the universe. Because we're still not considering the experiences that other people have in religious groups that exist worldwide. So we are still being self-centered and totally all about ourselves. Mic drop. There we go. It's a mic drop. Now, I spent all week doing this. And it's beautiful. Okay. Mm -hmm. Brush is the template from Microsoft. It's super cool. It is really cool. And I spent all week doing this. I was actually going to dig up more stuff, but we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it instead because some of it, when I put it up on the screen, is going to narrate bad. And so we have to have context because the goal of this is to have context. Okay. So this is our agenda is to examine both. Can everybody see or am I in the way? No. Okay. So to examine both the bad and good of Christian history. So we're going to own our history. Okay, we are going to own what exists in Christian history. And we have to confront the fact that other religious groups are not better than Christianity. Okay, we're really going to go there. I really can do this. Like I said, all week. Okay. So why the discord about all this stuff in modern times? And then we're going to talk about and discuss questions and stuff like that. Okay, so for the sake of this, okay, my degree is in religion actually in philosophy and theology but it's fine okay that's fine for now um there are three a couple of different ways that people define christian and i think that that's kind of important for this not all christian group except the veracity of other groups that might be classified as christian and it's a whole thing and i don't really care today so and when i don't really care we're not talking about it so there are actually groups that maybe don't actually meet the definition of being Christian according to other believers. But for the sake of the presentation, I'm using the religious terminology and religious heading. When you classify and you study religions, there are the Christian religions or groups that classify under a Christian heading. And what that basically means is that it's any group that claims Jesus Christ is a central figure. That's for the sake of this. Do I necessarily agree with all the groups that are going to be presented in terms of Christian in this today? No. But for the sake of clarity, that's what we're going to do because that's just easier. All right. So let's first do some background so you all know that I know what I'm talking about. What? Yeah. Okay. So this is sacred geometry, which is found in a lot of different things, which is why I picked that. Okay. So to understand the history of the world, its successes, its cultures, its wars, its victories, its defeats, its insights, and its motives, one must understand religion. And I said that. I said that a really long time ago. So I said that, though, because I understand that most people probably don't care a whole lot about religion in modern society. They really don't. They don't like it. They're not interested in it. They think it's boring. But that's because they don't see how it really is actually the crux of culture. It is the crux of history and it is the crux of a lot of context. So like we will talk about later in this, 
Actually, we're not going to talk about this particular thing, but it does relate to something we are going to talk about. The number zero emerged in India. Okay. Zero did not exist in any other culture in the entire world. And we talked about that in sacred geometry, that everything starts at one. And if you study the significance of ancient numbers, you don't ever find zero. And why was that? Correct. They had no concept of nothingness. Everything basically started from a central point. Mm -hmm. We would understand the creator, and it went from there, and that unity, that basic unity was the foundation. And so they didn't understand nothing. Why would nothing emerge in India? Buddhism. Buddhism. Because they have the concept that basically one day your ultimate goal is to be nothing, is mm -hmm. to basically... I remember seeing it in, in one of my professors just demonstrated it by lighting a match and then extinguishing it mm -hmm. and that smoke the kind of smoke dissipating going up that was nirvana that the goal was to basically kind of fade into nothingness because the goal was to have nothing you don't want to suffer you don't want to feel anything you don't want to have any problems sounds an awful lot like what we often hear in society doesn't it so just a thought but the idea of nothing or of zero came out of a culture where the goal was nothing. Makes sense. It's a mood. Hmm? It's a mood. It's a mood. <laughs> I used to say, when I had a bad day, I was zen smoking. And the joke about the zen smoking was that the idea of the, the smoke and the smoke rising up and the nothingness, and so I would say, I'm in a beautiful, happy place. I'm smoking a cigarette. Now, I had never smoked a day in my life, but that's the irony is that I would just sit there and hold it, and I would just watch it go up. So, how I got here. So, I've been in religion for like 25 years when I sat down and I started counting, and that really bothered me. So, I first <laughs> decided I was interested in religion when I was trying to figure out how I wanted to ruin my life, and religion won. Okay, religion won. So, you know, it could have just as easily been something else, but that was how it was. And as I've come to learn, especially over the past few years, that everybody is not half as interested in religion as I am. So, you know, I'll just start talking about stuff like in normal conversation, and apparently people don't do that. Okay, so, you know, like, for example, I'm on the phone last week, I guess it was. It must have been the week before I'm on the phone. So I told a guy I'm seeing, I could like watch tower literature. And then I heard myself and I said, oh my God, who does that? You do that. I'm saying, <laughs> oh yeah, so by the way, I kind of collect watch tower literature. Who collects watch tower literature? I do, but I actually do. And there's a reason for it, but we're not going to get into it here. And how I started was in scholarship and in interviews. I had to do a project on religion. I had to interview five people. I went way beyond five people. And people had to sit there and tell me what they believed in. Sometimes it was really great. Sometimes it got really, really weird. Then I expanded it and started visiting other services and other churches. And a lot of times history I came to find when I started to really take the interest in stuff like that other people don't. I would find that I often knew more about the history than the people I interviewed. So I love when Jehovah's Witnesses come to my door. And I swear I'm blackballed because nobody comes anymore. I love when Mormons come to the door. I open it up and I talk to them. It's like, yes, okay, let's have a conversation about this. Like the fact that the first 11 pages of the Book of Mormon are plagiarized off another book. No one ever comes back. I really, really, you know, it's just like nobody wants to talk to me. So they don't really understand often many times origins versus construct. And so how I kind of describe it is that we have conceptual theology. We have the way that we understand God. We have the way that we kind of interact or our faith interacts. But then we have what might actually be the reality behind a group or the facts behind a group. And most people don't know that stuff. So I loving facts i know all the facts and it irritates people so every religious group though has aspects of their history that they don't want to read out loud and in some groups we're a lot more understanding about that 
than others. And that's kind of where today comes in to all this. So most people just in general don't really understand religion. They don't understand the complexity of it, how it shapes civilizations. One of the five things that was a standing sign of a civilization when I was a kid was that they had a religious system. They had to have a language, they had to have a written system, they had to have a government, they had to have an economy of some sort, and they had to have a religion. And that was because back then that was all they did. All of those things kind of overlapped. So when you study world religion, especially if you study ancient systems like paganism, based on as much as we know about them, not this modern stuff that's more based on masonry than actually the pagan systems that existed, which is true. They have the three initiation rites, and even Gerald Gardner, who founded Wicca, admitted that he based it off of Freemasonry in part. So everything now is new. Nothing is, is really authentic. It's constructs of what we think that we know. But all they did all the time was have their ceremonies and grow their crops and sacrifice stuff. That's pretty much what their whole lives were. And so everything else kind of revolved around it. If you even think about it in the Bible, when we talk about the emperor and that the emperor was basically considered to be a god, everything that they did in that society kind of revolved around that. It wasn't here where we go to church and then we go home watch football and nobody even remembers the sermon by 7 o'clock at night. It was a very, very, very different world. But that we don't understand that because religion is so foundational, it's the source of a lot of things. So people fighting and people wanting to fight for what they believe in and fight for their values and fight for their ideas and fight for their territories. And, you know, it causes conflict. It causes issues between people because it shapes how people see the world. And it's more than just matters of belief. That's one of the reasons why some of what we're dealing with in culture today is a lot more complicated than just people suck. People do suck. I mean, I'm not going to deny that at all. And I'm in your message, but you know, it's fine. But it's more than just fear or ideas. These are worldviews and they don't often change simply. And religion is very seldom the teachings of only one person. I would even say it's very seldom even the teachings of a few people. You have central figures. So in Christianity, Jesus is the central figure, but so is Paul. Paul more probably than the rest of them. A little bit, yeah. Maybe Peter more. And James. Peter and James kind of are trailing in there. But then you've got a right them, and then we have this is 2023, and there have been other people who've written since then or who did stuff since then. So then if you're a Lutheran, you've got Martin Luther. If you're a Calvinist, you've got John Calvin, and he sneaks into a lot of stuff. Or then uh, Wesley, John Wesley, Wesley, John Wesley, yep. Everyone in there is so great a cloud of witnesses. Yeah, everybody in 250 people in the book. I mean, you know, now they all didn't write, but yeah, I mean, there are other influences. And so to say that it's just the creation of one person, is also very misleading and that interpretation is more complicated than the way such is viewed in modern society so everybody has an opinion about religion and nobody has done the work and it irritates me so i'm on there all right i don't tell y'all how to wire computer systems and we're really grateful that i don't tell everybody how to do that because it would probably blow up okay we don't know, uh, you know, I don't tell people how to put together their cars or how to change oil or how to write. Well, I do tell people how to write. That's, that was, okay. <laughs> Scrap it. But I, I do tell people how to write because I've done that for a long time. But everybody thinks that they have the answers because they watched a video on YouTube or they went to church once as a kid. And we have seen the results of people going to church as kids. They think that Moses was the one who threw the rock at Goliath, or there was this one time some guy told me yeah. that Robin Hood was in the Bible. Oh, oh yeah, that was a great, that was a, that was a conversation. So I mean, or you know. Or Noah mixed up with Moses. Or asked us who Noah was. Mm -hmm. That happened once and I was like, oh, you're serious. Oh, okay, and yeah. so it was like, oh, um, you know. Or they think they watched a YouTube video and everybody's an expert now and that irritates me because we treat the Bible with contempt in re this regard. We don't see it as respectable as other texts. We pull it apart. We argue over it. We don't really treat it as if it's a record of, of anything sacred. 
And so that gets on my nerves. And there's a reason that we study, and there's a reason we have scholarship, and there's a reason we have people who do this. And yes, you, you, you had a moment. Sorry, she's a woman. Yep. Because you said scripture is a woman, and of course we don't do this with a man. Of course not. And we do it with the Bible. We do it with the church. And I said, think about how people treat the church. They treat it, they want it, well, for it's there when it, they want it. They want it, they don't want to take care of it. They really don't want to bother with it. They only want it for when they're interested, and then they want to leave it alone. We treat the church like we treat women, but that's all other issues. So, yeah, think about that. Yep, that's because it's a girl. So, when I got into this about 25 years ago, the attitudes we had about religion were very, very different. So how I kind of put this is that hostility toward the church was really for atheists. And I'm remembering Madeline Murray O'Hare. I'm remembering her on Donahue before she got killed by somebody who was in her own organization. But that's a whole other story. She was an atheist. She was an atheist. She's the, she petitioned for something in schools. Prayer, something about prayer I don't remember exactly what it was but she uh, was the she was kind of the face if you look her up Madeline Murray O'Hare was her name she was kind of the face of atheism and atheists didn't like Christians Satanists didn't like Christians but nobody took them seriously because they were like a circus act so and I'm I mean we can laugh but I have a hard time taking Satanism seriously for that reason but it was kind of targeted at Christianity and people who were classified as unchurched, meaning that they didn't have a group and unchurched does extend beyond Christianity was kind of rare and they were kind of secretive about it. So they didn't want everybody to know they didn't go to church all the time and they kind of were submarine Protestants, you know, they'd surface every Christmas and Easter and then they'd go back down again. So, you know, you <laughs> You know, they didn't go every week, wow. but it was kind of on the DL. You didn't want everybody to know you didn't go to church because that meant you weren't a good person kind of thing. And so this is like the 90s, the mid-90s, early 2000s, somewhere in there. The first real figure I remember being openly unchurched and very ambivalent toward religion was Oprah Winfrey. And that's only relevant because she was such a big figure. And so for her to kind of take that position was very very unusual and she would kind of have a new age leaning if i was going to describe her in a certain way so now all these years later christianity has gotten a lot of bad press so the pedophilia scandal in the catholic church and now everybody's got something somewhere or you've got the evangelical leaders who i want to say that one of the first that was came out was ted haggard was he was all anti-homosexuality and then he got caught with gay prostitute. And I think that he had drugs too. I think he had amphetamines or something on him at the time. And then, you know, we've got all the mega church leaders who fall and whether they've committed suicide, which everybody has to debate about that. Nobody said, gee, how come nobody took care of them? Or how can, you know, why don't we look at what the system did to them? They just kind of do that there. And there is kind of a general criticism of belief is hypocritical. And so that is, it's newer, I would say, what? Since two, after 2000, it wasn't even in 2000. You know, the past maybe, it's what, 2023? Maybe 15 years, maybe a little bit, long, little bit longer than that. So let's talk for a minute about the good and bad in Christianity. So here's some things that someone should have thought about before they did. So let's just be honest, the Holy Roman Empire is probably a really big thing. Now what people don't know is the Holy Roman Empire was actually an attempt to revive Rome in the year 800 under Charlemagne, and it was a political entity throughout Western, Central, and Southern Europe in the hopes of restoring the Roman Empire, and it was a very unholy alliance between the Catholic Church and the monarchy, and a lot of very bad things happened because of that alliance. So like you've yeah. always said, Christianity does better when it's a persecuted entity rather than a political one. It does, they don't do well with power. We didn't learn anything from when the Israelites wanted to be a monarchy. We didn't learn. No, of course not. Of course not. No, of course not. Of course not. That would make too much sense. Of course not. <laughs> but the reading and learning about the past. Just oh, uh, uh, yeah, right. You, you know. Stop your history. So. The thing that strikes me, though, 
when I remember when I actually did all this the first time, you know, 20 years ago, the number of years that these things had power needs to kind of shake us into complacency. The, the Holy Roman Empire was there for over a thousand years. Oh, that's the one that lasted. 800 to 1806. The Roman Empire didn't last that long. No. Jeez. And it changed. Things kept shifting and changing, and they would have different territories. And it, when we do um, middle church history in seminary, it will make more sense because basically that is the Holy Roman Empire era minus 200 years. So it goes from about 700 to the um, the Reformation. So, yeah. That was that. And so it was a bad idea. Didn't work good. But it still happened. And how it kind of started was that bishops were basically used by the Roman Empire to distribute things. So like when there was a disaster or they needed food or they needed goods. That was how the church kind of got involved in all this. And then you have this established monarchy trying to revive the empire. Then we have the Crusades. Like I say, we're just going to own all this because they were a series of religious wars. They were actually over the Holy Land. A lot of people don't actually know what they were over. They just go, oh, the Crusades. And I go, and what were they? And they just go fighting. And I go, over? <laughs> versus... Muslims, was it North Africa? Yes, mm -hmm. but I'm going to say this, it was over the, uh, with the Ottomans, but it was a little bit more complicated than that because you also have the East-West divide in Christianity, which was the Byzantine Empire. Mm -hmm. And the Byzantine Empire kind of started to falter and then you had the Ottomans in there and they were at times fighting the Byzantines, they were fighting the Turks, the Ottoman, the, the, the Muslims. They were fighting predominantly over Jerusalem and the Holy Land, and then they started fighting over other things. So the last of the Crusades was actually between uh, preliminary Protestants, like the early Protestants before the Reformation and the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. And that went on from 1026 to 1291. So the Vaudois or the Valdensis community, they're known by both names. And years. Good gracious. Yeah, and it was, very, it was a lot of fighting. So the Inquisition. So, 800 years, no, 700 years, till 1908? Till 1908, and I will explain oh. that. So, like I say, this is stuff nobody knows, but me and facts. So, I, I go, why is this? And then I start reading it, and I go, all right. So, an office set up by the Catholic Church to weed out heresy among Europe. So, the Inquisition... Um, was also in the Americas. A lot of people do not know that. Which on um, like the Salem witch trials? And stuff. No, no, that was no, that was very Puritan. That was okay. not Catholic. The Inquisitions were in South America, so in Brazil. Oh. Um, they targeted Jews, pagans, and Protestants. But like we say, 1184 to 1908. Now, they didn't have the trials up until 1908. But on the books, they still had people that were being killed or were being brought in. And the Catholic Church has a list of material it deems heretical. And what they did in 1908 is they took the Office of the Inquisition and they turned it into the Office for the, Doct for the Congregation of Doctrine, I think is, the, is what it's called now, something like that. And now the Inquisition goes on in a different form in the Catholic Church. It's not actual Inquisition, but they mark what they classify as heresy. So, like for example, there was a woman who had visions, the big white books over there, that's four volumes, we need to get the other three. It's called Poem of the Man God. Those are considered heretical by the church. They are not considered to meet standards. And like, for example, when you have a Catholic Bible that has something in it called an impromptu, if you don't have that, it's not considered an authorized Bible. It has to have Catholic footnotes. Mm -hmm. So, fun facts. So then we have the Atlantic slave trade, which I think I put on here, but if we're going to be fair, there were people involved in that who were not Christian. So, like we say, we're just telling the truth. So. It was the transportation of enslaved African individuals to the Americas by slave traders, mostly from Europe, although not exclusively and not exclusively Christian either. 
and Christians justified the slave trade by misusing Bible passages. So that went on from 1525 to 1808, and what they did after that is they imported Italians. So another little fun fact. And then we have the religious right, which started in the 1960s. It started under the Johnson administration because they instituted what we now know as nonprofit or 501c3 federal nonprofit status. That in order to be a nonprofit, because this was during the civil rights era, you had to have a statement that you would not discriminate. And lo and behold, Bob Jones University and Jerry Falwell of Liberty University didn't want to follow those rules. They felt it was a violation of their religious rights. So they formed the religious right. And what happened was after they kept losing, and kept losing, I mean, there were court battles about this. They kept losing, they kept losing, they kept losing. They kept like, losing. we got to unite or something. Let's go. Let's, let's, let's abortion. pick abortion, and that's literally how it happened. That's how it happened. They were yeah. sitting around, they had all this money, they had to figure no, out what it was going to be. Before that time, the majority of Christians were actually for Roe versus Wade. Yeah. Oh and now, it is a Christian political faction noted by ideals considered conservative or traditional, seeks to influence policy with their ideas and values. And you want to talk about a lump of group of people that don't go together, it's predominantly evangelical, Christian, Roman, Catholic, and Mormon. They have money. There's money in that. Mormons have money. Of my enemy is my friend. You got it. So, surely these different issues merit an explanation, and they certainly do. And this is what I would say. Okay. And I'm not excusing anything. But the first thing that we need to recognize is that these decisions were not made by the average Christian, and the average Christian probably didn't have a whole lot to do with a lot of these decisions. Just like any decision that's policy in this nation. I mean, how many of us have wanted to crawl under our chairs when we heard something that certain people in certain administrations said? And then I said, my friend in Australia, I said, I am I am so embarrassed that this is the representation that you guys all have. So that's the first thing is that only a minority of voices have spoken for Christianity throughout history. Just like only a minority have spoken for any religious group because nobody had any power. And until modern times, it was often one denomination or one group of the majority of the power that did not speak for everyone. So for example, the Protestants of the Reformation were making their stand because the Roman Catholic Church was not going to speak for them. And that's why I said in the beginning we're using the Christian heading for everybody, but the Roman Catholic Church don't speak for me either. So, you know, I mean, we get into some of these specifics and these technicalities. And quite frankly, certain classes and castes of people controlled the Christian narrative throughout history. History is written by victors. So, the majority of Christians today would condemn and denounce the actions of groups of Christians that failed to live up the teachings of Jesus in years past. I mean, all I don't know anybody who goes, yeah, Inquisition, great. Okay, actually, I take that back. There are Catholics that do try to defend it. They go, well, it wasn't as bad as everybody thought. And You know, there are, but not one of them. So on, we would own the negative points in Christian history, and we would recognize that there are people in every religious group that don't live up to the founders' expectations. And that's true of any group that exists anywhere in the you world today. people who are like, what the founding fathers of our country stand for this. Yes. Like, Probably. Yeah. You know? And but just. Even, yeah, but even with the people who are like, oh my God, like the founding fathers of America. Like, right. Do we really know what they would do? We weren't there. And you know, and same type of thing, just because people don't always measure up to what they're supposed to be doing doesn't make the value untrue or the idea untrue. So let's correct the myths. Christianity is a white man's religion. That's a very, very big accusation on the internet. Historically speaking, Christianity evolved in the Middle East, North Africa, near Asia, and Southern Europe, all areas that are favorable to dark-skinned individuals who are not considered white by any standards. <laughs> hey, isn't the oldest, one of the oldest churches in Ethiopia? Yes, yep, and one of the oldest Bibles is in Ethiopia as well. So this whole idea yeah. that... <laughs> <laughs> That this is a white person's religion is not accurate. And don't make the mistake of confusing modern interpretations, American in parenthesis, of Christianity with its actual origins. Okay. So, even among modern groups, there's often great diversity seen in Christian practice. Christianity is for everyone, so it's as much for white people as it is for anyone, even if it's not a white narrative. Like we say, 
There are white people in the Bible. The Galatians were, were Celtic Christians who were living in Asia Minor. And Revelation talks about every tribe and tongue. So there are white people in the Bible, but it's not a white narrative, and there is a difference between the two. Mm -hmm. The Bible endorses the behaviors of those throughout history. And I said it's true that the Bible often displays the worst characteristics of human behavior as well as reflecting narratives and customs of the ancient Near East, for example, slavery. Okay, It's in there because it existed. It was a thing, it was a part of the system. But the context of many of these practices varies from modern interpretations therein and does not, when properly understood, justify wrong behavior. It was a different system that existed in a different time that was related to debt. It wasn't, let's go over to this continent and steal a bunch of people and make them work for free. It was a different context than we understand now. And understanding the Bible is more involved than a few passages taken out of context or discussed by people who are not qualified to do so. Christianity is the religion of the elite. That is a total and complete misappropriation. Because the earliest followers of Christianity were women, widows, orphans, single adults, and the poor, all individuals who were marginalized by society. Christians of the earliest times suffered great persecution and martyrdom under societies that did not accept or understand it. And ruling classes didn't take an interest in Christianity until the evolution of the state church because that was an advantageous thing. And I just explained to y'all a few minutes ago how it evolved. The bishops basically became agents involved in distribution of food and stuff to the people. So that's how that became a thing. And it became advantageous. They wanted to build up their armies. So that's how that all came about. But there are Christians that have done really cool things that don't get any credit. So Lawrence was a very early church deacon who, when demanded of the Roman perfect to give the goods to the poor to the government, he told them to go screw themselves. And as a result, they killed him. So there have been people who have done stuff. Perpetua and Felicity were two women from Carthage in North Africa. One was a noble woman and one was her slave. And one of them was pregnant. I think it was actually the slave who was pregnant. But because they were Christian, even though they acknowledged the secular system, they be, saw themselves, they were friends. They saw themselves in Christian family, and they were both martyred together. Oh. Dirk Williams, he was interesting. He was an Anabaptist. He escaped from prison, and somebody was following him. And the guy fell through the ice, and he turned around to save his pursuer. And then they turned around and they arrested him and they killed him. Yeah. Josephine Butler was an English feminist and social reformer who worked in education. And she actually worked with prostitutes. That was why I put her on here, where she was one of the first who went in there and who discussed medically invasive practices in Europe because they would basically they called it steel rape they would take the instruments and because they suspected somebody was a prostitute they would examine them and so because of her they stopped doing all that and then we've got maximilian kobe he was a really cool story he was priest and he was in auschwitz he was there because he was hiding jews and he actually went to his death for his cellmate so apparently there are people that do things and that do live up to their faith it's just not maybe the narrative we're comfortable with or that we hear. It's not the ones in power. It's not the ones in power. So are other religious groups better than Christianity? So let's move through here a little bit fast. So first I do Judaism. Now, I have no problem with nothing with nobody. This is just facts. These are just, like I say, I like facts, okay? So they all have their history where it's questionable, okay? Let's be up front, the Old Testament there are passages where they go in and they kill the entire group of people all the way down to the children. Okay, so that's, a, that's more of a part of their history than Christian history, although Christians are always taking the brunt for it. But that is a part of their history. Just go in and do an offering of the entire nation to everybody. The Hasmonean dynasty um, was a group of people that lived in South Judea who were forced to convert to Judaism either by exile, force, or death. Nobody ever mentions that. I didn't even ever hear about that until this week. <laughs> God, I was today years old when I learned that. I was that today, I was, I was Tuesday years old when I learned that. Now, and I mean, I've studied this stuff for years and I never even read about that. The kingdom of Himar was 
was a, a situation. There was a king who converted. And over 22,000 Christians were martyred and massacred, giving the choice to convert to Judaism or die, and that was in the 4th century. And the Zionism is not necessarily an offensive ideology, but there are a number of very zealous Zionists who advocate aggressive war and justify them with Old Testament texts. And as a result, the establishment of the State of Israel, you had a whole group of people that went in and overthrew the Palestinian government and put them in little areas in their in little sections of the country where they're basically under occupation they can't work it takes you 12 hours a day to get anywhere they make an average 500 dollars a year next to the people who live in israel who make way more than that and they don't have their freedoms they're losing their culture they're having to leave mm -hmm. so yes so they got put in their own ghettos pretty much pretty much yeah and so these are things that we consider questionable Okay, that are a part of their history that maybe they don't want to own or maybe they don't want to talk about on paper or they don't want anybody to know about and so guess who found it all. So what I would say is that why is context necessary? If you look at Jewish law, if you look at the Talmud, there's a lot of stuff in it that's questionable. Including like, for example, there are, there are passages about that, you know, you can marry but you can violate but not marry a girl who's not Jewish. There's one about violating a girl when she's two years old. Mm -hmm. Now, oh, that rates context, okay? It's about property laws and it's about dowries. And that's why I didn't put it up there because people read that and they're going, oh my God. You know, you go, oh my God. First of all, these are very old laws. Okay? These are really old laws. These are from before now. And it's like I say, if I'm going to play devil's advocate for Christianity, I'm going to play it for everybody. So, yeah, it sounds horrible. And we hear it and we're shocked, but it's from a different time. And it's talking about a property law relating to dowries. So, in other words, what happened at about two people were weaned. Now, there are other things in the Talmud that state other things that say you're not, that you shouldn't do this stuff. Or that there are other passages like, for example, that do talk about the debate if something happens to somebody when they're that young, <coughs> do they still have their virginity preserved? And there are people that argue, yes, they do in the Talmud. But if you don't have context, it sounds horrific. It sounds like, oh my God, what are these people doing? And isn't that exactly how the Bible sounds to other people when we don't have context? And so that's why I didn't put any of that up here. I mean, there's stuff that talks about makes the Gentiles sound less than human. And all of those things are used in anti-Semitic literature because they take them out of any sort of narration or context. And this is how hate starts. And I don't want that to happen to Christianity. I might be too late on that. But... Nobody mentions these things because there's a context to them. But even now in certain Jewish communities, a woman can get divorced, the man can still divorce her for any reason, and he can take the children. And she will never see those children again. They have their own courts, they follow their own rules. And if they try to go to secular court, the Hasidic community will put up the money for the man to go and win, and they will just keep wearing her down until she is not. They take all the property, they take her children, she's basically left destitute. And that still happens in some communities today. But nobody's talking about it. Now there have been a couple documentaries, there have been a few people that have come out and that have discussed it, but it's not the narrative when you go on the internet, you're gonna hear. But that is still a thing. And there is sexual abuse in Hasidic communities. And it's a very big deal because they don't prosecute it. So they don't believe in going to outside sources. And then there are ultra-Orthodox Jewish communities that don't work and they live off welfare and they have six, seven, eight kids. So, owning our stuff. Islam is a little bit easier to kind of go to because violence has been a part of Islam's history from the literal beginning. They have been fighting since the claim of the Prophet Muhammad, which I question whether or not Muhammad was actually a literal figure, but I'm not going to get into that there. And so corporal punishment, capital punishment, all of that is a part of the foundation of the religious group. Then you've got different exiles throughout history. So the Mawaza exile 
when Jews of Yemen were banished by the decree of the king Imam, and then they were sent to a barren part to the area to either face their fate or die. So now we know why Jews and Muslims don't get along. They've been fighting from the, the beginning. They, they've been fighting from it. The Alahad incident is where the Jews of Mashhad, Iran, were forced to convert to Islam in 1839, or they would die. A lot of them practiced their faith in secret. The Ottoman Empire, we talked a little bit about the Ottomans earlier. They were kind of brutal, and they forced conversions among Greeks and Assyrians. And after the fall of the Mosul, you've got Assyrian Christians, and now this is in 2014. So let's just talk about that. We're forced to convert to Islam, pay Giza, which was a taxation or face execution. By July 19, 2014, a complete Christian exodus from Mosul was the result marking the end of 1,800 years of Christian presence in the area, and the first time a mass was not held in that city in 2,000 years. And that is in our time. This is not stuff that was from another time. So, better than Christianity. No. But what I would say is that Muslim law and history, it's like we say, while well, the word Islam is from the word for peace, the religion holds to the teachings of jihad, which is interpreted different ways by scholars, but has an aggressive tone to it, that basically you have to be willing to put up and to die for your faith. And there's a lot of other stuff in Islamic law that's very, very questionable. There's more than we're gonna get into here, including a lot of very violent penalties, including killing those who are apostate or those who even abuse or misspeak about their founder. There was a guy, uh, Salman Rushdie wrote a book about it, I don't even remember what it was called, and they actually put out a death threat on it. So there are crazy people everywhere. And once again, we overlook this stuff. And still, Islam is very patriarchal, uber patriarchal. In many Muslim countries, the death penalty is still a form of punishment for a number of moral crimes, including adultery, blasphemy, and you guessed it, homosexuality. Beheading was state law in Iran until 2014. Wow. And it's also enforced in Qatar and Yemen, although they don't really do it but it's there. And so there are still instances of child marriage in Muslim countries. And men can carry multiple wives and non-Muslims while women can't. Two women are considered to have the same legal witness as one man. That is true today. And sexual segregation occurs in mosques worldwide. They put me in the back of the building when I was there and I said, now I knew what y'all felt like being shoved in the back of the bus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> At that moment, I was like, they just, they put us in the back of the mosque. Buddhism, now everybody thinks Buddhism is nice and peaceful, right? Oh wait, did I go too far? Okay. Yeah. So they have self-inflicted violence. So they have a really long history, like they'll set themselves on fire and protest. I wonder if they want to become nothing again. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, pretty much. Um, suicide is actually, like, has a whole part in it, which is why, what is the killing? Sufuku? Sufuku, yeah. Sufuku, however you pronounce it. And it's basically honor killing where people kill themselves rather than facing that they didn't do something dishonor. I guess that would be the way to put it. There was mass killing of a group in India that was a rival Buddhist school and 18,000 people were killed in the third century. It's disputed if that actually happened or not, but at some point in time, somebody did something. Everybody's always fighting in India. So, I mean, and I don't, I don't say that casually. They're always fighting in India. A warlord, a warlord guy, whatever his name was, attacked another group, killing 20,000 people, including a le legendary warrior monks in 1571. That was in Japan. And then we've got the League of Blood, which was this unordained Buddhist preacher guy sought to assassinate westernizing figures because he wanted to restore power to the emperor. And so 20 people were targeted and two were assassinated. That was 1932. And in the Rohingya genocide is in Burmese, and their killing, um, the killings are targeted at the Muslim population there. So now the Buddhists don't like the Muslims. So this is, you know, a very good scope of the world. So Buddhist law and history, violence is considered prohibited in their, any circumstances in Buddhism. But remember how I said these are more than one person that's writing the narratives. They have found ways to kind of explain it or to get around it. And the reason for this is because being entirely anti-violent is not practical in history. It's a nice idea, okay? I am a radical, and I'm saying that as a radical pacifist, 
okay? I said, the, the guy I've been seeing is ex-military, and I told him I protested the Iraq war, and then I said, you're welcome. Okay, I believe very much in pacifism, but it's not always practical. It's not always practical, and so nonviolence is not always practical. Poverty rates are highest in Buddhist countries worldwide, and a lot of people will think about why. They have no aspirations. The goal is to be nothing. There you go. <laughs> worldwide because many are converting to other systems because it's not working for them anymore. And there are reports of monks in rehab for drugs such as methamphetamine and reports of sexual abuse among monastics. So, stuff happens everywhere. Hinduism, go through that really quick. Hindus are, and, and Muslims and people in India are always fighting. It's a very conflicted country. And so you have, part of that would be the long-standing social system is the caste system. So when your system is so rigidly defined by your social standing, there's always going to be conflict because you can't move out of caste. So your hope is like, let's say you're a street sweeper. You're going to sweep that, sweep, sweep that street really, really good. And then in your next life, you'll get to ascend and be in the next caste. If you're really bad, you'll come back as a city urchin or something. But, you know... <laughs> You know, basically, this is an entire hierarchy that's there. Anti-Muslim violence, these are all very, very recent. The India was partitioned in 1947, the India-Pakistan border. The UN needs to stop partitioning things. They partitioned Palestine and Israel, too, and look how good that's worked out. Mm -hmm. What they did is because the Brits wanted to withdraw from India because they spent too much money on World War II, they changed the landscape of the countries. And who would have thought that this might be an issue for everybody who lived there? Gee, you know, they created Pakistan. Hindus have engaged in violence and riots against Muslims, including the destruction of a 430-year-old mosque in 1992. And that has been ongoing since 1947. So entire lives, people's entire lives spin that they don't know anything else. There were riots against the, um, the Sikh community who complained about Hindu control. They wanted to be autonomous. And then people were arrested. And then they retaliated and they killed Gomaye. Uh, was it? Oh, in Indira Gandhi, that's who that was, was then assassinated. And so yada, yada, yada. And it goes on. There's anti-Christian violence. Since 2000, there have been a number of Hindu threats against Christians and all forms desecrating cemeteries, destroying homes and churches, and killing foreign missionaries. And that continues to this day. And the India-Pakistan cricket match in 2022 should be an embarrassment to everybody. This happened actually in Britain, where there was a clash in the UK over a cricket game between India and Pakistan. So the Hindus taunted the Muslims, and they went and paraded around their neighborhood and then the Muslims retaliated by burning a flag, and here we are. So, yeah, Hindu law and history, religious law is seen as binding on everybody. So whether you're a Christian or you're something else, you are bound by Hindu law in India. And much of Hindu literature defies Hindu life, although a lot of it could be classified as obsolete. A lot of it's weird. And even though it's considered to be the height of enlightenment and insight in much of the world, there's a reason the nation is still developing because to this day, patriarchy is still the standard. Arranged marriage is still custom, although it's not done as often. And female infanticide is still practiced in parts of India. Approximately 21 million girls are unwanted and do not receive adequate care to this day. And 85% of women in India have been victims of some sort of domestic violence. So let's put this into facts. 85 out of 100, that means only 15 women in India out of 100 have not been beaten by an intimate partner. Yeah, so other assorted groups, these are just quotes because I wanted to put them in somewhere. So the New Age movement, the thing everyone thinks is all brilliant and enlightened and going to save the whole world, right? The anatomical resemblance between man and the higher apes, so frequently cited by Darwinists, is pointing to some former ancestor. 
Common to both presents an interesting problem, the proper solution of which is to be sought for in the esoteric explanation of the genesis of the pithecoid stocks. We have given it so far as was useful by stating that the bestiality of the primal mindless races resulted in the production of huge man-like monsters. You should see your faces. The offspring of human and animal parents as time rolled on and the still semi-astral forms consolidated into the physical. The descendants of these creatures were modified by external conditions until the breed dwindling in size culminated in the lower apes of the Mysopian period. With the later Atlanteans renewed in the sin of mo the mindless, this time with full responsibility, the results of their crime were the species of apes now known as the Arthropoid, and that's from differentiations of species. And yes, for y'all, that's a commentary on race. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that's right. Yep. And I could get into that whole thing and why that is because a lot of people are not aware of the fact that the idea of the of certain species is inferior to others was a part of science at this time in history. Mormonism, you see some classes of the human family that are black, uncouth, uncomely, disagreeable, and low in their habits, wild, and seemingly deprived of nearly all the blessings of intelligence that is generally bestowed upon mankind. This first man that committed the odious crime of killing one of his brethren will be cursed the longest of any one of the children of Adam. Cain slew his brother. Cain might have been killed, and that would have been would have put a termination to that line of human beings. This was not to be, and the Lord put a mark upon him, which is the flat nose and black skin. That is by Brigham Young, who was the second president of the Mormon church. And they believe that how y'all get redeemed is that when Jesus returns or the end of time happens, y'all will be white. So, and if you think it's just religion, that's the problem. Just because I'm going to get an email about that. This is the history of atheism, and I gave them their questionable moments. So there was the French Revolution, a de-Christianization campaign, including removal and destruction of religious objects, with churches converted into temples of reason featuring atheist ideas and anti-moral homilies. It only, about that it only lasted cool. for seven months. Okay. In revolutionary Mexico, the Mexican Constitution of 1917 was enacted as an anti-clerical and restricted religious freedom with the goal to eradicate religion in Mexico. They were not successful. All groups had their property seized by the government. Eventually, sanctions relaxed. The League of Militant Atheists in 1925 was a work of communist atheism, a propagation organization put in place to force conversions to atheism as the Russian Orthodox Church and other religious groups were now suppressed in the USSR. The Eastern Bloc, Catholic and Orthodox leaders alike were denounced, humiliated, and imprisoned by communists in Poland, Hungary, Lithuania, and other Eastern European countries that was after World War II. And the Cultural Revolution in China, which those who have taken my thought reform class know what we're talking about there because this is the foundation of cult criteria in modern time, was the Chinese government relaunched a re-education campaign throughout the country, establishing atheist ideas as those prominent in the nation. Methods of thought reform through propaganda, torture, and imprisonment were first studied there by Robert J. Lifton in the 1950s. So that sucks too. So why the discord in modern times? So this is what I'm going to say. People are people everywhere, whether we like it or not. And whether we like religious ideals or not, or what they may, whether we agree with them or not, religions are full of people. And we have an entire generation now who grew up on the idea that the church is hypocritical, that it's full of people that don't do things, that it doesn't take care of children, that it doesn't take care of its own. And as a result, the idea about the U.S. being a Christian nation and defending bad policy with Christian value. So we have an entire generation now who doesn't remember anything else. They don't remember church like we grew up with or like I grew up with. And rather than start new groups, which was the historical approach, that's why you have different denominations and sects, and every religion has them, no matter what they tell you. Christianity is not worse than that than anybody else's. The answers to narrow to either re-examine and change or to abandon them altogether. 
there isn't as much solid Bible or religious education as there probably should be just for the sake of understanding culture. And I also think that there is a draw to anything that is not what's familiar. So we like exotic things like, you know, hot yoga or this or that because it's mystical sounding and it's different. And you're just stretching in, in a hot room. It's not exciting. And <laughs> the truth is that yoga, as we understand it in modern construct, is not ancient and it is not Hindu. It's very, very American and it's very commercial and it is totally... And it doesn't different. really work. And it doesn't really work. That's a whole other thing. But then we also have the idea that we like the idea of things exotic and enchanting coming, even if the association is appropriated. Okay, so example, Native American smudging. Now you got people running through their house with sage, burning stuff. You can buy it like a craft store. Or at, at Books a Million. That was where we were. I mean, you know, now that's totally not the context that it's in or that it has. It's a ritual. It's not just, ooh, let's make the house stink. Let's you know? buy this thing for $10. And right, and, and get rid of all the negative energy. You know, it's not what it's about. Or you for well burn your own money. <laughs> yeah, right. Or modern pagan ceremonies, like I said, that are more based in Freemasonry than anything ancient, and they ignore the genderism present in paganism. Paganism was a fertility region. It was all about gender, and you were defined by your gender. And Exactly. So, summary. I would never suggest that we judge every single person in the entire religious group in modern times by the information I've presented. I wouldn't, because... These are long-standing groups with long-standing traditions and long-standing issues, and people don't always agree with everything that everybody in a group does. Most probably don't even know the history of stuff I've mentioned here. The average Mormon does never read that quote by Brigham Young. I can actually assure you of that, because they really polish their people real nice. And even New Age people, they don't know all this crap. They don't know none of it. I believe that each group should own it. They, we all should need to own our dark parts. We all need to own what's in there. It can't just be the Christians do it and nobody else does it. That's not right. And to be and to be fair, Christians probably don't know a lot about the Caribbean position. Right. All of this other stuff. No, yeah, they yeah, don't. They, they don't even know their own church right. histories. No, because they yeah, and there's also the oh, we're Christians, not Catholics, and it's like right. We're stop. the Crusaders for Christ. It's like please stop. We it's need like yeah, yeah right. <laughs> we're gonna rebrand our name so it's not as right. Visible. People don't know. No. And so spiritual abuse happens in every group, whether or not it should happen at all, is a different conversation. It's a fact. We're talking about facts today. It happens. And we all have traces of earlier histories that are less than ideal and that don't live up to modern standards for ethics and values. We, it's just human nature. It's just a part of human life. But majority rule always leads to tyranny, religious, regardless of belief systems, because people are people, and everywhere there are people who don't live up to their proclaimed values, and that doesn't mean we throw out a whole religion or bash a whole group or stigmatize everybody in it. Thus, Christianity needs the same consideration and understanding that we would extend to any other group. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs> so, anybody have any questions? Yes. I have a comment. If sure. That's okay. Sure. So this, by the way, is very d delicious. <laughs> <laughs> it's just delicious, okay? So, very juicy. Uh, yes, <laughs> juicy, juicy. Uh, so, okay, my dad was a mm -hmm. Bible scholar. Right. And so, like, he, I remember, like, right before he passed away, like, I remember, like, walking into the kitchen, and he was having, like, this crisis of some sort where mm -hmm. he had research something and he was like this can't be right like this this mm -hmm. just can't be right and i walked out of the kitchen because i was <laughs> like something's happening with him right. i don't know what's happening um and so i remember doing a just a gen not like yours just a <laughs> general sweep of the history mm -hmm. of christianity and i remember it almost broke me mm -hmm. as a christian growing up mm -hmm. from child being mm -hmm filled with the Holy Spirit at four years old, mm -hmm. speaking in tongues, the utterance of the faith, mm -hmm. and all of that from the time. And then when I got out of, you know, when I began to grow, and doing my own research about the history of Christianity, mm -hmm. like I literally had, it was almost like a mental 
like mm -hmm. it was like I, I I had to like stop everything for like a little bit because I was like this mm -hmm. is not happening mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. my dad didn't teach me this yeah. nobody else taught me mm -hmm. like all the bloodshed behind Christianity right. and mm -hmm. kids chopping off and mm -hmm. just torturing people like I like to this day, it still bothers me. Mm -hmm. But I've managed to like move forward, and like that's why I was telling you last time. Mm -hmm. Like I don't, I don't consider myself a Christian mm -hmm. because I'm like ecumenical because I pull positive things from like different religions. Mm -hmm. Even though like I, I, I'm Christian at heart, I still believe in Christ. We live in a Christological, you know, existence. Mm -hmm. But when I found that out like that, just it broke me. So. Mm -hmm. With everything you just said, some of it, some of it I've heard before, and some of it was like, mm -hmm. like it's blowing my mind. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, I when it comes to stuff like this, I don't know. Like, your summary is amazing, but I don't know how to pull it all together. Mm -hmm. if, if that makes sense, because it's a lot to take in. Mm -hmm. That's <clears> this. <throat> human nature, like the reason that we are so drawn to binary systems, the black and white thinking is because it's easy. It is not easy to reconcile these really, like, basically your personal positive experiences, you know, growing up, being part of this religion, and then being like, oh my god, but also this religion has also, like, perpetuated a lot of horrible things, and so, like, that there's, like, a cognitive dissonance there, and yeah. I think it's very... It's not human nature to try and reconcile those things because it's not easy. Um, I don't know where I'm going with this other than saying, like <laughs> trying to embrace the complexities is really difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. That was that was nice way to put it. Thank you. Because I will say I went through a really very similar crisis of faith when I was 